Hi, in this video let's discuss few important topics in general surgery in the form of MCQs. You can find the soft copy of these MCQs in surprise test number 17, right? So coming to the first question, the thickness of a thin partial thickness skin graft is so we have a skin graft based on the involvement of the surfaces or surface layers. We have full thickness graft or partial thickness or split thickness graft which is also called as the Hirsch graft. So full thickness graft is something which involves epidermis as well as complete dermis whereas partial thickness involves epidermis and varying thickness of dermis right. I hope you are all familiar with this concept. So the question is what is the thickness of thin partial thickness skin graft so partial thickness or split thickness is again subcategorized into thin medium and thick based on the thickness so the options include 0.1 to 0.2 mm 0.2 to 0.3 mm 0.3 to 0.4 mm 0.4 to 0.5 mm right so as i mentioned split thickness also called as partial thickness split or partial graft. The spelling is T H I E R S C H. Thiersch graft, which is subcategorized into thin, medium, and thick. Thickness of thin subcategory is around 0.2 to 0.3 mm. And the same values in inches, it will be 0.008 to 0.012 inches, right? And medium thickness is 0.3 to 0.45 mm. And thick, it's around 0.45 to 0.75 mm. So the question is based on this particular value. So the thickness of thin partial thickness skin graft is so it is 0.2 to 0.3 mm right also remember partial thickness is also called a split or thierge graft now let's move on to the next question rule of nines is for so you might have heard of this term rule of nine so rule of nines is for obviously it's used in uh, burns uh, burn injury for assessment right anyways we'll go through the question rule of nines is for determination of burn size estimate the extent of injury both none of the above so which one do you think is more appropriate so rule of nines the moment you come across this rule of nines you'll hear one uh, scientist name valles so Alexander Valles introduced rule of nines for both determination of burn size and also to estimate the extent of injury. This is very, very important. So it's both. And as you know, usually in adults, I mean, we have this total body surface area, depending upon the amount of body surface area that's involved, we give some percentage, right? In a normal case scenario, head and neck, upper extremities constitute 9% of total body surface area each. So 9%, 9% and 9%. Anterior and posterior trunk 18% each. And lower extremities 18% each. So uh, along with that genitalia, perineum and all this constitute around 1%, right? Yeah, perineum and genitalia will be 1%, right? So 9, 9, 9. 18 front 18 back and lower to extremities 18 percent each and genitalia uh, 1 percent right so a rule of nines in case of adults now moving on to third question golden hour so golden hour is frequently asked in uh, several entrances so golden hour refers to time elapsing from injury to start of definitive treatment in hospital or time elapsing from loss of consciousness to start of provisional treatment or time elapsing from start of definite treatment to regaining of consciousness option d none of the above so what do you think is right answer and what do you mean by golden hour 
So as, as the name itself indicates, the first 60 minutes is considered to be very critical wherein the body has uh, a mechanism to compensate for shock as well as trauma. After 60 minutes, this compensation mechanism or compensatory mechanisms diminish. So within the first 60 minutes after the injury till the person receives definitive treatment in a hospital setting is considered to be golden hour. So as we can see option A golden hour refers to time elapsing from the injury to start of definitive treatment in hospital. Also make a note that first 20 minutes, I mean within the 60 minute slot, if we divide it accordingly, first 20 minutes, next 10 minutes, and then next 30 minutes. So first 20 minutes discovery of trauma site and information being passed to emergency medical team right 108 in our instance right so first 20 minutes discovery of trauma site and information passed to emergency medical team and then you have platinum 10 minutes the 10 minutes is mentioned as platinum 10 minutes the aim is to assess intervene and package at the site of trauma to prevent further damage right so the aim is to assess intervene and package at the site of trauma and last 30 minutes emergency medical team attendant coming and transporting the patient or the person who suffered injury to nearby hospital and achieving stabilization right so that's very very important so golden hour can be further divided into first 20 followed by platinum 10 minutes and then 30 minutes i hope it's clear now, moving on to fourth question. In tuberculosis, the edge of ulcer is punched out, sloping, raised, undermined. So it's another standard question, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So what kind of edge do you find in case of tuberculosis? Something like this undermined because the rate of destruction of subcutaneous tissue is far more greater than the destruction of overlying skin as a result of which you will have this undermined orientation fine so in tuberculosis the edge of ulcer is undermined whereas punched out edges are seen in case of gomatous ulcer or deep tropic ulcer sloping edge in case of healing traumatic or venous ulcer raised or purely white beaded edge in case of rodent ulcers raised rodent and rolled and averted edges in case of squamous cell carcinoma i hope it's clear now moving on to the final question i've given you a matching where you have many terms starting with hutchinson so hutchinson's freckle hutchinson's pupil hutchinson's sign hutchinson's teeth hutchinson's fracture and on the other side you have various options uh, uh, for sake of matching herpes zoster ophthalmicus uh, uncle herniation lentigo maligno uh, involvement of radial styloid process or seen in congenital syphilis so let's see how many of you are going to answer it right so first starting with hutchinson's freckle so Hutchinson's freckle is nothing but lentigo maligna or maligna in situ where you have malignant cells without invading the underlying tissues, right? So Hutchinson's freckle, I'll just make a note of that here. Hutchinson's freckle. It's nothing but lentigo maligna or maligna in situ, right? The initial stage without involvement. And then you have Hutchinson's pupil. So it's nothing but blown out or it's nothing but a midriasis where the pupil opens up or dilates and it doesn't close even with response to light. It's because of uncle herniation which is the innermost part of the temporal lobe. So Hutchinson's pupil dilated pupil dilated pupil or blown out pupil in uncle herniation
so ankle herniation is nothing but uh, it's considered to be a trans tentorial herniation where the innermost part of the temporal lobe herniates thereby compressing oculomotor nerve along with oculomotor nerve compression oculomotor nerve is surrounded by parasympathetic fibers which supply the pupil because of involvement of parasympathetic fibers first uh, because of this compressive uh, pressure compressive related um, uh, phenomena there will be dilation of pupil and uh, pupils will not constrict even with response to light and along with parasympathetic supply even the oculomotor nerve is compressed as a result of which the eyeballs are down and out because oculomotor uh, supplies all the uh, muscles which help in various movements of eyeball except LR6 and S4-4. So you have down and out appearance of eyeballs because of involvement of oculomotor now and because of involvement of parasympathetic fibers surrounding oculomotor now there is dilated pupil. Midriasis, a sort of midriasis, right? So that's Hutchinson's pupil. Then what is Hutchinson's sign? So Hutchinson's sign is nothing but herpes joster ophthalmicus. In fact, to be more precise, it is vesicles at tip of nose in case of herpes joster ophthalmicus. So herpes joster ophthalmicus is nothing but reactivation of herpes joster in ophthalmic branch, the first branch of your trigeminal nerve. So because of which uh, you know about nasociliary nerve. So in fact, the vesicles at the tip of the nose are seen because of involvement of nasociliary branch. As this nasociliary branch supplies cornea as well as the nose there will be vesicles or involvement even in the nose. In fact, the vesicles at the nose or tip of the nose are seen initially before other symptoms of herpes joster ophthalmicus appear. This is called as Hutchinson's sign. So vesicles at tip of nose in herpes joster ophthalmicus because of involvement of ophthalmic branch, nasociliary branch as well. Fine, I hope it's clear. And you have Hutchinson's teeth, which you're all very much familiar with. Small, widely placed teeth, notched incisors, seen in case of Hutchinson's. Uh, I mean, it's one of the components of Hutchinson's triad, seen in congenital syphilis. So Hutchinson's triad is again different. Hutchinson's teeth are those which we discussed now. Hutchinson's triad are interstitial keratitis, notched incisors, and auditory nerve or eighth nerve deafness. And finally, Hutchinson's fracture. It's nothing but fracture of radial styloid process. This is also called as Chauffeur's fracture. I mean the driver's fracture or backfire fracture. So let me leave this question unanswered. Find out and let me know why Hutchinson's fracture is also called as Chauffeur's fracture or backfire fracture. It has something to do with the job of a driver. Uh, historically if not now historically so Hutchinson's fracture is nothing but fractured radial styloid process fine so obviously the answer has to be one three two two three one four five five four so it's option A so Hutchinson's freckle Hutchinson's pupil Hutchinson's sign Hutchinson's teeth Hutchinson's fracture so these are some of the important topics which I wanted to cover in this video. I hope it's clear.